record this. So try to keep the noise level down because I am going to record this for the sake of the, I think we've got three or four people that aren't here today. And I want to make sure that they get a chance to uh, to see this as well. Every man for himself. No. So here we go. 2D barcodes. So yesterday, we talked about one-dimensional barcodes. I thought it would be a good time to show you the difference. What you're looking at on this, on this page right now, on the bottom, actually I don't know if the bottom is or not, but you, you're looking at 1D barcodes that only read X to Y or X direction, just across. The lines only go in the vertical direction. And then you'll see up in the top left here, you'll see a UPS proprietary 2D barcode. You see it's got a little target in the middle, and there's all this data surrounding it. All barcodes are the same thing. They are a collection of binary digits. They are ones and zeros. That's all they are. So yesterday I taught you guys how to read a code 39. I taught you how to read a UPCA. And again, this one actually, my, my uh, Coke model today actually has the full UPC, so it's got all 10 characters with the start and the end and the checksum at the end. Um, but there's variations of that. There's a short UPC. There's you know code 39. There's uh, all kinds of stuff. But today we're going to concentrate on all of the 2D barcode stuff. What's this proprietary? So UPS has a proprietary barcode, which means it's only specific to them. They make the readers, they make the printers, and so you may, you probably can't download an app to read that UP, UPS barcode on your cell phone. When it comes to the data matrix code and the QR code, you can probably with just your typical camera, right? Just your camera on your phone can you read a QR code just like that. If for some reason you can't, you can get free apps that will read all barcodes. Code 39, UPC, uh, data matrix, QR code. But you won't be able to find an app for the UPS because that is proprietary to them. Yeah. So looking at the data matrix and the typical QR codes, comparing them to the UPS barcode, the UPS barcode looks like it's printed at, uh, I forget the name of it. Dot it's, matrix? It's not a dot matrix. It's a, it's a certain type of perspective where it's a top-down angle. Yeah. Is, yep. there, is there a certain reason to that as opposed to data matrix or... I can't tell you the details about the UPS because I don't, I don't know the details and you can't find, I don't think, I mean, you could probably look online and figure something out. But yeah, you're right. The UPS barcode is a little bit more advanced than the data matrix code, meaning there's more data there. Um, that little target in the middle is kind of like those little squares on the QR code. Those kind of set the, the orientation of the code. So I can see where the center of the code is, or I can see where the left edge of the code is, or I can see where the right edge of the code is. Same with the data matrix code. I just got to get my pen here. Hold on here. Let me get a color up here. Pointer options, pen, ink color, red. Oop. There we go. So if you look at the data matrix code, the one way that you can tell the orientation of the data matrix code is you'll see a solid bar here, and you'll see a solid bar here, and then you'll see that these kind of dot around the edges. Do you see what I'm talking about? So it's solid along this edge, and it's solid along this edge, and then it's dotted around the other edges. That's how it orientates the code for, for reading purposes. Um, because this could be on a box, and the box could be turned 90 degrees or 180 degrees, we can't control the orientation at which that code is coming at us, so we need a way to orientate around that. The QR code has very similar things. These targets help to orient that code help to orient that code and then the, the actual code are all those little bits around it. I don't know as much about the UPS code, but I can tell you they always have this funky little target in the middle and things are going to be oriented around that target. Um, again, I, I couldn't give you the detail to proprietary technology a little bit different than the others. Um, this one here, we can read this today. You guys can't read it right now, but we'll be able to read that code within the next half hour here. You guys will be able to read that code. Yep. Do the targets hold any data, or are they just there to align? No, they're typically there for orienting the 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 uh, orienting and giving size or perspective to the actual code itself. So it might tell me how much data is there. Like as a data matrix code gets bigger, these little dashes will go out further, 
And the data matrix code can get rectangular or bigger and square. And QR codes can do a similar thing. Again, the UPS, I'll draw a big question mark because I just don't know. You know, but, I, but I'm sure it's a very similar type of technology. So similar to the 1D barcode, um, the 2D barcode is just a collection of bits. So and anything that we do, for the most part, when we're talking about digital logic or, or analog to digital or anything like that, it really is just a collection of bits. So whether it's a, an encoder on a motor shaft, um, it's, it's a barcode, or even if it's something as simple as a, a, a photoelectric sensor detecting the front edge of a box, that one to zero transition or that zero to one transition is giving me data. Now some of that data is just on off, but other parts of that data could represent other things. So I think we actually looked at the barcode generator yesterday. And the barcode generator I showed you yesterday, um, you could actually generate a QR code or a data matrix code. I think I showed you guys that tonight, where we actually showed code 39, UPC, uh, data matrix, and QR code. Um, there are, there's a specific site, this data matrix, um, k -A -Y -W -A. Um, That's a site, another site. You can just Google, though, and type in data matrix code generator or code 39 or UPC generator, or whatever it is you need, and it'll actually allow you to put data in and print out the code you want. So a data matrix code is a two-dimensional matrix barcode consisting of black and white cells or modules arranged in either a square or rectangular pattern. The information to be encoded can be text or numeric and data. So this is a different deal too. Code 39, we had alpha and numeric and a couple of symbols. UPC, I only get the uh, I only get the numeric data matrix. I now can get anything in the ASCII table. So that's any key that's on a computer keyboard. I can generate that character using data matrix code. So if you want your if you want your data matrix code to represent a website, www.dunwoody.edu, you can make it do that. Um, that's probably a little better application for a QR code because the QR code is meant to not only look at the data, but also to open a link. So QR codes are really more web enabled versus data matrix codes are a little bit more data enabled is what they are. And again, as you look at this, just remind you here real quick, this is a solid line here. This is a solid line here. These dots along the edges, those things are not part of the data. So this is not part of the data all the way along the left and bottom edges. And this is not part of the data all the way along the top and right edges. The data resides in the middle of that. What that means is those are only there for the purpose of orientating the code. So regardless of the angle that it's coming in, I can know where the code starts and where the code finishes. All right, so solid border and dashed border orient the data matrix code. Each L-shaped cell is a byte that represents a number from 0 to 255. Where have we, where have we seen that number 0 to 255? Uh, on PLCs, on addresses. Yeah, but specifically on anything that's 8 bits, which is a byte, right? 2 to the 8 gives me 255 or 256 characters, but my addressing would be from 0 to 255. The X, as you look at this, the X is going to represent our least significant bit. Our least significant bit is the X. Now, I'm not going to try to, I'm, I'm always going to give you the same block. I'm going to give you this one that is, what is it? Let me look here real quick. Four, I think it's 12 by 12. So this is a 12 by 12 data matrix code. It's a perfect square. That means there's 4, 8, 12 in that direction, and there's 4, Eight. Oh, I did three. Four, eight, twelve in that direction. So there's twelve boxes or twelve data points in each direction. So I have a, essentially I have 144 boxes that can be either black or white. Those are my only options. Again, the outside border is only for orientation. Only the stuff in the middle matters. When they talk about an L-shaped byte, that L-shaped cell is this right here. So like here's an L-shaped cell. This is, I think this says byte number six. So byte number six is that orange cell right there. Now what you can imagine is 
if I code more than 12 bytes, this thing's going to get elongated. Um, it may get more rectangular. It might be 12 by 14 or 12 by 18, or it may get bigger as a square. It might get 18 by 18 or 16 by 16. So it's going to get bigger and bigger. And, those, and the position of those L shapes are going to move around depending on how, how, how big or small this gets. Um, there are certain sizes that are kind of predefined for a data matrix code. So you can't like say, okay, I want a 13 by 19 data matrix code. Um, there are certain sizes that you're limited to as far as what you can do with the data matrix code. And that comes up later in the, in the presentation here. When you look at an L-shaped byte, each L-shaped byte can represent a number from 0 to 256. Now well, let's see, is that right? So 128, if I add up all the numbers in here, right? If all these numbers were on, then I'd have 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. It's actually not from 0 to 256. What is it really? 0 to 255. There's 256 possible things, but they really are going to represent a number from 0 to 255. So if I ask what number is being represented here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the bits that are actually on. So a bit that is turned black is actually on. So remember the basics of barcode. And I actually think this does come out at 2. Well, it doesn't matter because we're still going to subtract 1. Um, remember the basics of barcodes here. What we're going to do is the light is going to shine on this code. And the black areas are going to absorb the light. And the white areas are going to reflect the light. And so the black areas for this particular code are considered on. Okay, so the white's going to reflect back and show up as off, and the black is going to be absorbed and show up as on. So if I look at the areas that are in this code, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of branch this guy out here and kind of say, okay, that's a cell that's on. And then I have four cells down here that are all on. Does that make sense? It, it kind of masks what I have up on the top there. So I can see that the, the bit associated with 64 is on, the bit that's associated with 32 is on, the bit that's associated with 16 is on, 4 is on, and 2 is on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take those numbers, 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 4 plus 2, I'm going to add them up, and that's going to come out to 118. This is my number. Okay. Now, the next thing I'm going to do with that number, so everybody makes sense, black is on, white is off. It's that simple. The next thing I'm going to do is I am going to subtract 1. So that 118 gets a number subtracted from it of 1. Why? That's a really good question. I, gotta rem I was going to say the 256, but we just proved it's actually 0 to 255, didn't we? trying to think here. So let's think about that for a second. Why would we subtract? I know it's true. Go ahead. Is it because it's doing the um, same equation with the 8 bits on like addressing how 2 to the 8th is 256, but because 0 itself is a bit, it goes back down to Yeah, you know, my, my trouble though is we, the problem, the problem I have with that, with that analogy is we can actually, if I add up all of these numbers, I get 255, right? Well, Dude, you why. did say that, going back to slide 4, you said the X represents the least significant bit, and that tends to always be that 1. Yep. Potentially. So but, I, but I can still represent a 0, right? Because if I if I have none of them on, I'm representing a 0, aren't I? That's why I was wondering. If Let's take a look. Have, I, can you have a, a, a blank? That doesn't have any. That might be the answer right there. Is it, it, we, may, we may always have to... Our max may still be 0 to 256. It may actually be 1 to 256 is what is what I think Jen is saying there. Let's go through it because I, I will promise you this is going to work. Um, this is this is the analogy. So I add those up, I get 118. All right? Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract that 1 from 118, and I'm going to get 117. Now this is where it gets a little bit fun here. We have something called um, ASCII code. So if I type in ASCII... Are you going to show them the, the floating donut? No, I'm not going to. I should. It's, it's, 
I'm not gonna show the floating donut. Maybe maybe after when I'm not on the uh, the video, I might. Yeah, the ASCII donut. That is actually really cool, by the way. So the ASCII stands for the American. Oh, let me see what the algorithm stands for. ASCII or the uh, it's the American Standard Exchange Inform. Ah, I forget what ASCII stands for. Hold on. What this acronym stands for? I think because EJ can't remember his lecture, we shouldn't have a test. No, that's not true. I think we should no. Right, right. All right, here we go. It's the American. It's the American Standard Code for Information Inter Interchange. What that means. What that means, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. What that means is when you press a button on your computer, on your keyboard, you press a key. I press that J key. The computer doesn't know J from Chinola. It doesn't know anything. All it knows is that you hit a button, and it's got a code associated with that button. So in this particular case, I also can use this for working with the, the barcode system. So when I look at that barcode, came up to 117. On my ASCII table, if I zoom in, I can find where 117 is on here. You. Is it to the right? Is it to the right? Far right column. Oh, very close. Oh, you're right there. All right. There yeah, I right see there. it. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. It's a little lowercase u. Do you see it there? So 117 is a lowercase u. So now when I go back in here, I can say, okay, that makes sense. Let me uh, bring up my PowerPoint slides again here real quick. Get out of this uh, presenter mode. You guys can't see it, but I can see it. Um, so I can see that 117 corresponds to a lowercase u. Oh, it changes my pen color every time I do that. Wish it wouldn't do that. White pen color doesn't do me a whole lot of good. So 117 is going to be a lowercase u. That's what it's going to be. So that equals <laughs> a u. Now what you'll be able to do <clears throat> is you'll be able to take any data matrix code and decode it. Not that you would ever do this in real life, right? Um, I hope you're not looking at parts coming down the line and trying to decipher the code. But what we're really after is what are the advantages of the data matrix code over perhaps um, you know the code 39? First of all, on code 39, we only had uppercase letters. And on code 39, we had numbers 0 through 9, and we had a couple of symbols. What do we have now? Way too much. All of it. We had anything that you can type on a keyboard. So now in, in data matrix, all of the keys of the keyboard are available to me. Spaces. Uh, uh, exclamation points less than, greater than, equals to. Um, any, if I can type it on a keyboard, it's on this ASCII table. If it's on the ASCII table, I can go ahead and uh, and utilize it here. Um, so and I don't even have everything up here, right? I just got 0 to 127 up here right now. But that is the bulk of what we're going to use right there. All right? So that is your ASCII table. So you need that. So now what we'll do is we'll look at how to work with this. So this is the data matrix code. So if somebody on their phone, if they were to scan this, how can I get it so that little thing isn't up there? If you were to scan that code on your phone right now, using using something, you'd have to have something that could do data matrix, um, you're going to get what this is going to spit out. But in order for me to work with that, what I have to do is I have to look at these, these bits, these bytes. Now here's where it gets tricky, folks. Not all the bytes are L-shaped. What that means is some of the bytes get broken up. Because it's a square and the L-shaped um, cell is an L-shape, it's not always real, real easy to see. Give you an example here. I'm going to draw this one here. You see where byte 1 is? This is byte 1, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, now I can see it. So there's, there's byte 1. But what do you notice the problem is with byte 1 there? It's missing part of itself, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's only got the left-hand six cells. Where are the other two cells? The They're over here. So there's the other two cells. So now if I want to if I want to decode this, what I have to do is I have to find a way to find out where these things are at in the real world. So first off, I got them kind of lined up here for my own sake. Here's byte 1. The least significant bit, which is the x right there. 
And then the other six bits, and this is where you need to be really careful. I'll show you what I mean. People, people want to, when they do this, they want to do this. This is wrong. What's wrong with this? You're missing. The edge is not data. The edge is not data. That's the exact answer I'm looking for. People, when you do the test, you're going to go to do this, and somebody's going to be grabbing these edge bits, and those edge bits are not actually data. So i got to be really careful that I'm not grabbing the edge bits, and I only want to grab the bits that are actually data. So I'm going to go back to my... So what I do then is I come over to here, and it's actually these six here. One, two, three, four, five, six just like so those are my bits and if you remember the way it works is as I look at this cell it's set up kinda like this I've got six over here and I've got two over here that is your data matrix cell so but always this bottom left or this bottom right is my least significant bit and I can see from the map here for a 12 by 12, the algorithm is going to say, hey, look, this X over here is your least significant bit. So I'm going to shade that one in first. Okay. The one above it is not on. It's white. So this one stays open right here. All right. Then I can see this, this grouping of six right here. The top right and the bottom left. The top right and the bottom left are on. So like if I was taking notes right now, what I would be doing is kind of mapping these out so I can see later on how is it that I came up with this. And if I do that, what I wind up getting is a cell that looks like that right there. And what I do is I take, okay, well, um, byte number one is 64 is on, because this is 64 right here. 32, 16, 8, 4 is on, so I'm going to add 4 to it, and 1 is on, so I'm going to add 1 to it, I get 69 is my number, I subtract 1, which we always do for this, and I get the number 68, that's going to be my magic number for this one. I go back to my ASCII table now, and I find out where is 68, 68 is D, that's 68. Make sense? Let's go to the next one. Now, unfortunately, I, I think I really shouldn't have. Sense a little bit. It's just like I'm just going to figure out how exactly do I group what? some of these? Because why is it that some are on one side, but then the others are on the complete opposite? So here's the way to think about it. This X, this X will always represent the least significant bit. That will always represent the one. It will always represent the bottom right corner of your L shape. So these two pieces are those two pieces there. Then the other one pieces are over here. Those are the six pieces here. This is quite quite legitimately, byte number one is going to be a pain in the butt, right? Because it's it's broken up. How about how do I know which one's the least significant bit? Because I'm assuming that when I read the X. I get it's the X, but I'm assuming when I read a barcode like this, they're not going to give me an X. No, you, you're not going to read a barcode like this, right? In, in, in the real world, you're not going to read them by hand. You're going to have a machine that you've set up to read them, right? Um, when you're doing it in this class, I will give you this, and I will give you this. Okay, because that's what I want yep. to know. Yep. If I have the graph that has the axes, yep. I can figure it out then. But I just figured you're going to be an asshole. And like, here, here's the, here's that would be that would be pretty bad if I if I did that to you, Matt. I agree. I agree. All right, so let's go to the next one now. Now what I will tell you is some of these are going to be painful, but number two, bite number two is easy, isn't it? You look at bite number two and you say, "Well, I got bite number two down cold." Bite number two sits right here. All of it sits in this blue region right here. Which one's the least significant bit? That bottom right corner, right? So now what you got to do, if I was taking notes right now, again, I would do this. I'd go over to the other one, and i draw in exactly where this grouping sits. This grouping sits right here and just about like that. There's my, 
There's my cells that make up that. So there are eight cells that make that up. Six on the bottom, two on the top, or six on the right, left, and two on the right, however you want to think about it. So when I look at that, I can see which cells are on. This cell is on, this cell is on, this cell is on, this cell is on, and this cell is on. When I look at that up here, I've rewritten it for you. This is 64, this is 32, 16, 4, and 2. When I add those up, 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 4 plus 2, I get 118. I'm minus 1, and my number is 117. Go ahead there, Dalton. On the test, is it, is it also going to be color-coded? It'll also it'll look... On the test, it's going to look just like this. All right? So now, I'm really not expecting anybody in their right mind to go out in the industry and, and read these things by, by hand. Yes, you are. You're expecting everyone. <laughs> no. Okay. But what I'm expecting you to do... Don't you need to be able to, like, look at it and know if there's QA is off? Or not QA, the uh, code. The assessment is off, like when you're doing uh, testing the test. Yeah, so so this this you got a good point there, Tina. Is you might have packages coming down the line, right? And the if somebody puts that sensor too far above, all of a sudden the resolution of the camera doesn't have the capability to read what we call a line pair, the ability to go from white to black to back to white again to actually detect an edge. Meaning what will happen is those black those blacks will start to blur together. So if your if your scanner is too high, or for that matter if your scanner is too low. If your scanner is too low, you might only be seeing part of the code, right? Maybe you, your field of view now is only that much because your scanner is too close to the product, right? And then the thing I really want you to be able to think about is if you guys are manufacturing a part out in the real world, um, if somebody says, hey, let's use a barcode, and, they, and you say, okay, well, what, do you, what, what kind of data do you want to do? And they say, well, we want this to take up, when somebody scans this, we want it to take, take them to our website. Are you going to use code 39? No. No. Are you going to use UPC? No. No. Are you going to use data matrix? No. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Are you going to use QR? Hell yeah. Absolutely. Or if somebody says, hey, I need to represent characters that include both capital letters, small case letters, symbols, and numbers, data can you use code 39? No. No. Can you use data matrix? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Gavin. Can we get an extra credit if we decode by sock? Decode what? By sock. <laughs> no. No, I don't think your sock actually has any coded message on it. But well, maybe it does. It might. might be the... I mean, it could lead to... It, it's like the, how the Declaration of Independence has a message in the back. It does. It does. Page, go find it. All right, so right now we have DU. I love that document. Let, let's, <laughs> let's go to the next one. Yeah. So going back to the UPS uh, post the cold line, um, I think it's the way it is due to what region and what address you have. Because shouldn't it bring up where the package has to go and where it's from and all that? Yeah, yeah. when you look at something like a postal code, so what Ed's talking about is he's talking about the UPS one here, right? So this is actually a, and this is an old picture, by the way. This is not a, they, they may have changed this 100 times between, between when I started teaching barcodes and when I actually in delivering this lecture, um, but very similar technology. Many of these, many of these postal codes or packing codes or things like that, they won't only include one barcode. They might include several barcodes: 1D barcodes, 2D barcodes, multiple barcodes. And one of those barcodes may be a code that the person on the package car actually scans when they put it on your doorstep. And one of those codes may be a code that a conveying line reads to sort it by by uh, by zip code. So as an example, the UPS package trucks go out during the day, they collect packages, right? They bring them to a central processing facility. It goes around a big conveyor that's like a mile long, and the boxes get resorted. From So if all the boxes coming out that package car went to 17 different zip codes, something has to sort those out. It's kind of like dealing cards. And so these packages are going underneath all these scanners, completely automated, and they're going to get pushed down slides to different trucks. Some of them may end up on a truck to New Jersey. Some of them might end up on an airplane to Taiwan. Um, but that could be one of the codes. You know, maybe the one code's just a zip code, 
maybe the other code has delivery information and maybe the other code has you know, I don't know, you know, some sort of information about the payment or the customer or whatever the case may be. When I worked at IWPO, it was start to finish. So, like, each of the codes had to match the codes to the round world, which had to match the codes to the zip codes, which then had to match the codes for the sorter. But they're all intertwined, aren't they? Yep, yep, I like it. Too many codes. Too many codes. Well, that was a really hard job because of that. Yeah, so now we go on to our third code here. So we look at byte three. This is where I want to be careful of, though. Like on the test, you know, Matt or somebody's going to be looking at me saying, how do I figure out where the least significant bit is? Well, here it is. But what part of the code, when I look up here, what part of the code does this chunk reflect? The bottom. The bottom. So that piece right there reflects these three cells right here. One, two, three, with this being the least significant bit. Where is the rest of my code? The bottom and the right here. So I can see it down in the bottom. There's the rest of it. That's going to be this piece here that's kind of shaped like a little bit of an L. And I can kind of see how this lines up up here. Then i got to find those pieces on the actual map up here. So I can, I can do it by kind of looking right below there. So I can see, even, even when I orient myself, I use that little dashed border to orient myself. I come over here and I say, well, that's that same location, right? So it's these three cells right here are the three that I want. So those three cells are all on. So I can actually redraw it if I want here and say that all three of those cells are on. So they're all shaded in. All three of them are on. Then I go down here and I say, okay, where am I at down here? This is a little bit trickier. It's down from here. I see it goes all the way down from there. And it goes down from there. So I can use those to kind of mark myself out again. Down from there and down from there. Follow that all the way down. And I get down to about, oops, sorry about that. Looks like it's right here. See what I did there? There's my cells down there. My, my uh, drawing isn't as good as it could be. But I can redraw that now and I can say, okay, here's the other cells I'm concerned about. And as I look, I can see off, on, so off and then on, then on, off, on, on, off, on. You can see that reflects exactly what I used as my answer key here. Go ahead. So for the test on Wednesday, uh, you said you're going to give us this color-coded chart. Yep. But is there going to be a tool for which we can uh, scribble on our screen with, like you, just to make uh, you guys, can, so what, what most students like to do when they take this test, is this is one of those tests where it's really handy to grab a piece of graph paper. Mm. You know, so I do, have, I do have scratch paper up here that's graph paper. The specific reason why I have the graph paper is people like to use it for doing stuff like this because it makes it a little bit easier. But you're right, you're going to want to do this on a piece of scratch paper. I've seen people put a piece of paper on their screen and try to trace it. Don't do that. Can you just print off the question? I could, but I don't know. He's late. I don't. I don't. Here's the deal. You're gonna find out really quick that it's gonna be obvious stuff. Mm -hmm. Meaning, meaning. So if you decode it and it decodes out to my last name or you know decodes out to ASRO or ELTT, you probably know it's right. If it decodes out to something that's completely off the wall, like if if it's if it decodes out to you know instead of student worker, it's student clerker or something. I don't know. You know. That's misspelled. Yeah, recrowd to need it. If, if it de well, actually, I probably would pick that. That'd be a good one to do. Um, but, yeah, but I, I'm not going to put random, just random characters. It's not going to decode to pound 32XL4 or something, right? It's going to decode to something. So that in and of itself means it's a little bit of a checksum for you because you know that you're probably on the right path, okay. right? Um, so in this particular case, I have 64, I have 32, I have 16, or I don't have 16, I have 8, I have 4, and I have 2. So 64 plus 32 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, that's going to equal 111. I subtract 1, I get 110. I go back to my, I go back to my uh, decoding here, and I find out that 110 is, what is it? Lowercase n. I bet you the next one is another n. D-U-N. I already two n's 
My brain's not. He doesn't know how to spell dumb words. Uh, let's go to the next one. I do want to do a couple more because these cells move around. So you'll see bite number four is right here. I'm going to go a little bit faster now, though, because bite four is down here. Now, what are these two pieces down here, though? Down here, are these least significant bits? No. That's actually your most significant bit down there, isn't it? That's the top part. Yeah, that's the top part. So now I need to find out where these are at. So I go here, here, which corresponds to here and here which gives me these six cells here. You're right. Yep, I'm just making sure. And then the other two cells are going to be these two cells, I think, right here. Does that look right? Yeah. My least significant bit is actually this one here. So if I redraw it, it's going to look like that. I get 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8. That adds up to 120. I subtract 1. I get 119. Go back to my thing. I get 119 on the ASCII chart. I'm going to guess is W. So I got D-U-N, W, D-U-N. And this is lowercase now. It is Dunwoody. So the good news is this one should go pretty quick now. This is bite number 5. Bite number five is easy to look at. Bite number five is right here. We likely could decode bite five and six at the same time because we think we know what the message is. Bite number five starts right below this black one here and right below that black one there. So that's going to orient me a, a little bit here. And I'm going to go here. I'm going to go down over there like that. Does that look right? So, EJ, are we going to get the coded message that says be started ranker oval? Yes, that is what we'll get. 64 plus 32 plus 16 equals 112. Minus 1 equals 111. If I look at the next cell, I'm just going to look at it since it's on the same screen and I'm, I'm thinking it's the same. Um, first of all, let me go look at 111 real quick. 111 is O, lowercase o. So I see that it's D-U-N-W-O, so D-U-N-W-O, but I think I can also do this one right now real quick. I'll do a different color real quick just to make myself a little easier. Ink color, I'll do, uh, what can you guys actually see though? Can you guys see a blue maybe? All right, so now I'm going to do these ones here and I can see it lines up with that one. So I go here, 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 here. just like so, and it is the exact same setup, so that blue one's also going to give me an O. Would you agree? Yeah. It's the exact same code, it's also going to give me an O. So I got D-U-N-W-O-O, -O. now I'll go to the next one, that's another O, and this one should be a D, but let's find it real quick, so this is bite number seven, bite number seven is over here, and the left side of bite number seven is over here. So the left side is going to be right here. There's my left side. Those three pieces correspond to this part here. Hopefully you guys can see that. And then these five pieces correspond to the rest of it. And so what I can see is that when I look, oh, i got to draw it over here though first. So I get one, and then it goes down three. You got to kind of make it look like square so you can kind of tell. So this one in the middle is on. The one on the uh, the bottom right is on. That's the least significant bit. I know it because it's got an X on it right there. And then out of these three, these two are on. So if I do that, I get 64, 32, 4, and 1. 64 plus 32 plus 4 plus 1, that's going to come out to 101. Minus 1 is 100. 100 would decode on the ASCII table to a lowercase d. All right, then bite number 8. This is the tricky one. On bite number 8, I need to give you exactly how this case is going to lay out. Um, because if you look at where bite number eight is, bite number eight's a little bit goofy. 
I got pieces down here, and I got pieces up here. I don't know that I'll even get to a bite eight for you guys. I, so it's like in that bottom left corner in the very top. Yes. Yes. No, that's it. So the, remember, there's there's seven cells associated with each. Is there seven on that? One, two, five. Eight. There's eight cells associated. Yeah, there's eight data points associated with each cell. So there's eight on this. Um, when we do a byte eight, I will have to give you the cases. There's different cases depending on how it's set up. This would be case one. And what do these things represent? The zero, this one, this two, this three, and this four. What do they actually represent? The bit. the bit. Two to the zero, two to the one, two squared, and so on and so forth. So, like, when I look at this, let me draw it over here real quick and make sure I can see it. So it's these ones here that make up those those top two. I'm looking at these two over here. Then the, then the three down from that. Okay, one, two, three. And then I also got these bottom three in the left corner here. So one, two, and three. So I got those three as well, right? Um, so what I need to do is I need to look at this and say, well, what's on? Well, this is the, as you look at it, this one here is the zero location. So two to the zero is off, isn't it? But two to the one is on. So two to the one is on, plus two squared is off, but two cubed is on, plus two to the four is on. How do I know it's two to the four? Because look at where it is. It's a four right here. That will correspond to this. That's a four. And then five, let's see, five is on, so plus two to the five. And then six is on, because this is where six is. And I can see six is right here, plus two to the six. So what I would say is, okay, this is 2 plus 8 plus 16 plus 32. If you don't know, you can put these in your calculator, right? 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. 16 times 2 is 32 plus 64. If I add all those, and you can see it on here now. I just redid it here. So this is 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 2. 2 plus 8 plus 16 plus 32 plus 64. That's going to give me 122 minus 1 gives me 121. If I go back to my ASCII table, 121 is a lowercase y. And now everybody's happy because now we've spent, we spent, spelt, not spent, we spelt D-U-N-W-O-O-D-Y. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Can you elaborate on that? So if tomorrow... If you're deciphering the code and all of a sudden you see D U N, you know, Q O O D Y, you might go back and take a look again, right? Rather than getting it wrong, you're going to say, oh, I bet you EJ wouldn't do that. But now I think maybe I would do it just to be painful. I don't know. How about you don't? No, I don't. Yeah, please. Yeah. Who, who has a scanner that we can scan this with? Is there anybody that's got a scanner that we can actually scan that one with? Let me do this real quick. I'm going to go to my eraser real quick, and I'm going to erase this. Can a, can a cell phone scan a data matrix? Can you scan no, that? you got to have a special app for it. Mine won't scan a data matrix. So it's probably scan a QR code. might not scan a data matrix code. Uh, let me see. Data matrix. Oh, I'd have to go to the Play Store, wouldn't I? I'm not going to do it right now. Um, but, yeah, you could scan this, and it would actually read out Dunwoody is what it would read. So you can test it off if you want to, if you don't believe me. All right, so next slide here. Oh, yeah, here's where it's showing you the blocks there. I'm kind of bouncing through them. The ones that are actually on, I colored in red. I don't know why I did that, but I did. Fortunately for you, um, you don't have to read these in real life, right? Oh, what I did, oh here, I read it. I used a vision. I used, used uh, uh, National Instruments LabVIEW Vision Builder AI which is Vision Builder for Automated Inspection, I took that code that you just had, and I ran it through Vision Builder AI, took a snapshot of it, let the computer read it, and you can see on the bottom left down here what it actually read there. Do you see that? Amazing. It actually read Dunwoody. So 
the in the real world you're gonna have you have different ways of reading code you can read code with a scanner which is pre-built to read barcodes but modern vision systems that are using cameras that can be used for inspection most of modern vision systems also have the ability to read barcodes uh, both 1d and 2d barcodes so we have the capability on vision builder we also have the capability using cognex insight uh, if you get into the vision stuff, our automation controls engineering, we do a lot of vision. We even get people certified on vision in that program. But much easier to deal with that than trying to read that by hand. Question, how much, somebody asked this earlier, how much data can this thing hold? Yeah, well, here's an example there, Ed. So the typical 12 by 12 is kind of your bottom left down there, right? Um, you can kind of get a count for this, you know, by looking at the data, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. There's your 12, but they get bigger and they get bigger yet. Um, they don't have to be square. They, they need to either be rectangle or square. They can't be like parallelograms or, you know, they, they can't have, you know, angles to them or stuff like that. They do have to be, they have to have right angled edges is what they have to have. Depends on the size of the matrix as far as how much code it can hold. So you can see in a in a in a uh, 12 by 12 row column, you can see the the types of data that we can get, what the data region is. 12 by 12, we end up with a 10 by 10. 14 by 14 is actually what we've been doing, which is really 12 by 12 worth of data. And you get eight bytes of data out of the 14 by 14, which is what we just did. We went after the eight bytes of data. The remaining data, you might say, well, wait a second, EJ, I saw there were more there were more bytes than that. We only went out to byte 8, which is this guy here. But there's a byte 12, a byte 11, 10, 9, 13, 14, 15. There's other bytes of data in there. But we're only allowed to use 8 bytes of that data. So even though there's 15 bytes of data or whatever it is, we only can decode, we can only code 8 bytes of data. The other data that's in there is what we call error checking. What is error checking? Yeah, it's the ability to make sure that the data is accurate. It's it's an algorithm that we use to check the data for accuracy. Go, Matt. Does it have anything to do with agent Smith? Yes. Are you an agent Smith? Yes, I have no idea who Agent Smith is, but yes. All right. Oh, so what you're seeing here is as I count through this. What you see is you see, I don't know why I, I built this slide kind of crazy. So even though the, the matrix itself is 14 by 14, there's only 12 bits of data. There's only 12 bits of data on there. So, so really for us, it's, it's 12 by 12. What happens if you get a number of 129 in bytes 1 through 8? This means that not all the bytes were used. <laughs> Uh, bytes 9 through 17, those are the ones that are going to provide what we call padding or error checking. I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to get into the details on the error checking. Um, I, I, I'll, all I do is I make a mention to this, that error checking is not trivial, and I show you a slide. I made an attempt to uh, do a little bit with what's called the Reed solomon algorithm, but essentially if we have a key, a pass key, that we multiply by our data to get an answer. So we get a key, we get data, and then we get data with parity. So as an example here, 6.3 times 14.2 equals 89.46. What if I lose my data? Well, then if I have 89.46 and I have my key at 6.3, I can get my original data back by dividing it back out again. You see how that works? So my data is only one part of this equation. My original data is this 14.2. And if I have a key that gets multiplied to give me a number, I always have the key. And if I have the number, I can always get back to my original data. You might say, oh, God, that seems like crazy. Well, it is a little bit crazy. Um, when we do error checking, the Reed solomon algorithm uses these other pieces of data and uses what's called a, a matrix algorithm. So we use an encoding matrix, we use a data matrix, and we get this data. And we can get back by dividing back out again. So it's that, that exact thing that I was just talking about a minute ago. 
I have a key, I have data, and I have data with parity. I'm not, this will not be on the test, this part. And I'll show you why. This is what I had to do to make this work. So an encoding matrix might look like this, where I have a sequence of numbers inside of a matrix. I'm going to multiply this by my data matrix. Regardless, I always use that same encoding matrix. I multiply it by my data matrix, and I get a resulting matrix. And we don't, obviously, this can be done by hand. This is, what, this is a course called linear algebra that we would do this in. Um, matrix multiplication, where we multiply cells. This times this gives me that. This times this gives me that. And I end up with this bigger group of cells that are going to go over here. I can only multiply an encoding matrix by a data matrix as long as those two interior numbers are equal. So even though this, this, this matrix is larger, it can be multiplied by this as long as the two. So this is a six in this direction and a four in that direction, and this is a four in this direction and a four in that direction. As long as the two interior numbers are, are there, we're okay. We end up with a resulting matrix. I think I might have done this. I don't know if I did. Yeah, there it is. That's what the chaos looks like when you're done. I think EJ is ages I am. So this is not, I did this just for the purpose of showing what it looks like. Nowhere in my wildest dreams would I expect anybody in their right mind to try to do this. This is painful, is what it is. We let machines take care of that 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 business. All right, so let's do this. 11.30 right now? Yeah. It's like 11.27. 11.27? All right, let's take until 11.45. Come back in here. I think I have a couple more slides, and I'll give you the rest of the time to work on worksheets. Go for it. DJ, you made the